I'd like to welcome each one of you to our devotional study today. We are starting a brand new book of the Bible today, and we are looking at 1 Peter, and uh, we will look at 2 Peter after this. And um, as we come into 1 Peter, there's a few things I want to mention today just by way of introduction. And uh, then tomorrow we will get into the thoughts, uh, or next week rather, we'll get into the thoughts of the book of 1 Peter. But as you come into the book of 1 Peter, uh, as in every book of the Bible, Gog, of course, is the author. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21 tell us that no Scripture... No prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So God is the author of all of the word of God, but yet at the same time, we know that God used 40 writers, approximately 40 writers, to pen the 66 books that we find in the word of God. Of course, Peter uh, is the one who was the writer of these two books that bear his name. Uh, it is a general epistle. It's not really um, written to anybody specifically or a church specifically, uh, but we're going to see that it is written to the strangers that are scattered through a number of different regions, and they were suffering for their faith. They were being persecuted for their faith. I would also like to mention, as we think about this idea of the introduction to this book, that uh, this book was written from the city of Babylon, not Rome. As a matter of fact, there is no real evidence, not only in the Bible or outside of the Bible, that Peter was ever in the city of Rome. Of course, we know um, that the Church of Rome would try to claim Peter as a first pope, but there's a number of problems with that. One, he was never ever in the city of Rome. Secondly, um, we know that Peter had a, that Peter was married. And uh, therein lies a problem as well, according to what the Church of Rome would have, have to say regarding these people and, and not being married. We know that Peter was married because Jesus healed Peter's wife's mother. And in order for Peter to have a mother-in-law, he had to have a wife. And uh, so, um, this book was written by Peter from, more than likely, from Babylon, and uh, also, there's a number of key words as you go through First and Second Peter that you will find mentioned. One of the words that you find mentioned many times in First and Second Peter is the word precious. As a matter of fact, there are seven precious things that are mentioned as you go through First and Second Peter. Let me just read those verses for you very quickly so that you know what they are. In First Peter one and verse seven, it says that the trial of your faith be a much more precious thing of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in that verse, we see that the trial of our faith is precious. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 19, it says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without spot and without blemish. So in that verse, the blood of Christ is precious. Then, Second Timothy, or First Timothy 2, verse 4, To whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed in Degam men, but chosen of God, and precious. So in that verse, we find out the Lord Jesus Christ is precious. Once again, verses 6 and 7 of First Peter 2, Wherefore also it is contained in Zion. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is, become, is made the head of the corner. So once again we see there in those verses in Second Peter, or First Peter 2 how the Lord is precious. Then in Second Peter 1, verses 1 through 4, we see these words. It says, Simon Peter, a servant... An apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith. Our faith is precious. With us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things which pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us unto glory and virtue 
whereby are giving unto us, and it says, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we meet, might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So there's a number of things that the book of First Peter and Second Peter refer to as precious, and we will see that as we move through these verses. Also, another key word in, uh, in the uh, book of First Peter is the word hope. And the word hope is used in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 3, in verse 13, and in verse 21. And also it is used in 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 15, where it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we will see that as it, when it comes to key words, that the word precious is used a number of times, and Peter reminds us that there's many things when it comes to the Christian life that is precious to the child of God. I hope this morning, or this evening, friends, that he is precious to you, that the things that are contained in the Word of God and the truths of the Word of God are precious to you. He also talks about that hope as being a key thought, and friends, what a hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, that certainty that we know that one day we're going to be with him and that we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. The key word of the book of First and Second Peter is the word suffer or suffering. Suffering or its equivalent is used 21 times in the book of First Peter. As, you go, as we study through this, we're going to find out and we're going to learn that the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to in every single chapter that we find in the book of First Peter, chapters 1 through 5. And not only does it talk about the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, but this is also an epistle that equips the believer to face suffering and enables them to face suffering, gives us what we need to face suffering in our lives as believers. Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not a possible thing. It's a definite thing. And we need to be prepared for that as believers. Now, with that in mind, let me give you a, an outline that Harry Ironside suggests regarding suffering in 1 Peter, and then tomorrow we will move into the uh, main teaching of the, the uh, introduction of 1 Peter chapter 1. We see that Harry Ironside says in 1 Peter 1 and in verses 6 and 7 that we see that we ought to see suffering as a trial of faith, that suffering is what tests our faith and helps us to see that our faith is genuine and that our faith is real and that it enables us to stand. He also talks about the fact in 1 Peter 1.11 that it talks about the predicted sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it tells us there of the sufferings that, that he endured and how the Bible prophesied about those sufferings even before they took place. In 1 Peter 2.19, we're going to see that it talks about suffering for conscience sake. That means that when we, be, when we know things are true and we refuse to compromise on those things regardless of what the cost is to us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 23, we're going to see that our example for suffering is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself and what he went through for us. 1 Peter 3 14 is going to introduce us to suffering for righteousness sake, standing for that which is right, and as a result of that, suffering as a child of God. In 1 Peter 3 13, it talks about Christ suffered for our sins. And friends, we ought to rejoice today that the Lord Jesus Christ was willing to suffer for us. In 1 Peter 4, 1, it talks about suffering to cease from singing. We'll look at that and what it means as we get to 1 Peter 4, 1. Then in 1 Peter 4, and verse 13, it reminds us that as children of God, that we are partakers of Christ's sufferings. In 1 Peter 4, 16, we will see that it talks about suffering as a Christian. And then in 1 Peter 5, 10, we're going to see that suffering is only for a limited time. That the suffering is but for a moment in comparison to the length of eternity. And it is a light affliction compared to the glory that we will have when we stand before him. Those are just a few introductory thoughts to the book of First Peter. 
And next day that we are together, we will we will look at the introduction to this book in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. I encourage you, take some time, read through 1 Peter, study it, meditate on it a little bit, and ask the Holy Spirit of God to teach you as we get ready to embark on a study of this wonderful book in the Word of God. Have a great day.